Welcome to To The Point. The next few weeks will be filled with visits from presidential and vice presidential hopefuls and their surrogates. As if you need examples, in the last week alone, former President Trump was in the state not once but twice. J.D. Vance, the Republican nominee for vice president, made his fourth trip to the state on Tuesday. And Doug Imhoff, the husband of Vice President Kamala Harris, was in Grand Rapids on Thursday. On Monday, Kamala Harris will be in Detroit. On Friday, President Biden is expected to be in the state, but details haven't been released. So, why all of the attention? Well, it's pretty simple. It takes 270 electoral votes to win the presidency. And right now, according to polling, there are seven states that are enough that they could go to either candidate. Michigan is one of those seven, and it's a state that is a must win, particularly for Democrats. The last Democrat to win the White House without winning Michigan was Jimmy Carter in 1976. He was running against Michigan favorite son Jerry Ford. Prior to that, it was 1948 when Harry Truman lost Michigan but won re-election by defeating Thomas Dewey. Michigan and its 15 electoral votes will be key for both Democrats and Republicans as the race for the White House continues for the next nine weeks or so. This week, a look back at two of the most recent visits from the major tickets. First, Ohio Senator and Republican nominee for Vice President, J.D. Vance was at a farm just outside of Big Rapids to try and persuade Michigan voters to choose the Republican ticket. Keep in mind that both segments today are from campaign rallies, and the two sides see the same circumstance in very different light. It is great to be in the great state of Michigan in 69 days, my friends. We're going to take this country back. We're going to elect Donald J. Trump, President of the United States, and it is going to start right here with the great people of Michigan. Now, last week, the biggest heist in American history happened right under Kamala Harris's nose. Somebody stole 818,000 jobs that she and Tim Waltz have been bragging about. Did y'all see that? Where'd they go? Now, you may not have heard this because our friends in the back, the media doesn't like to talk about it, but what really happened, what really happened is this. The Harris administration had to admit that more than a quarter of all the jobs that had supposedly been created last year were actually fake. They never existed. It was the biggest revision to the job numbers since the financial crisis back in 2008-2009. In other words, what it means is they are cooking the books to hide how bad the economy really is under Kamala Harris. I promise you this, on November 5th, there is one job that is definitely going to vanish, and that is when we tell Kamala Harris, you are fired, and send her back to San Francisco. Now, now y'all are fired up, and it's hot out here. Kamala Harris, she needs a rock star to get a crowd like this. We just come out here because we're patriots, and we want to save this country. Now, Kamala, I don't know if you noticed, if you paid attention to the news lately, Kamala has decided that the American people don't like her policies, and she's exactly right about that. Just take one, immigration. Kamala Harris, remember, she suspended deportations on day one. She stopped Donald Trump's Remain in Mexico policy. That was on day one. And that's why we have a wide open southern border. But I read a story this morning that her advisors are considering just copying all of Donald Trump's policies. They're more popular. She is, if you think about it, she's just a cog in the wheel of a very corrupt system. Now let's go back in time a few years and just remember the formula of Kamala Harris and her handlers and what it wrecked. Now step one, remember step one was to ship all of our good manufacturing jobs to Mexico, to China, to far flung corners all over the world. Remember, Kamala Harris supported the reauthorization of NAFTA, which has been terrible for the state of Michigan, the state of Ohio, and the state of Pennsylvania. Proud towns became ghost towns. Dignified American workers became dependent on the government, and families, including a lot of families like mine, fell apart under financial stress. Now, that was step one. Did we ask for any of that? No. Now, here's step two. Step two is open our border to millions of illegal immigrants. No. 
And into that void, into that void of joblessness, poured drugs and a lot of cheap labor. Our leadership, including Kamala Harris, they said it was compassionate, but it was a lie. What they really wanted, my friends, was millions of voters for Democrat policies, and they wanted millions of cheap laborers. American wages went down, and our leaders learned they could ignore their own citizens in their quest for power. Now, that was step two, and I ask, did we ask for that? No. Now, the next step was a lot of stupid foreign policy. Our leaders couldn't deliver prosperity, but they could deliver war and conflict. So we invaded countries all over the world, and then we invited other countries to invade us through illegal immigration. Our people got poorer, our leaders got richer, and they got more powerful. Now that was step three, and I asked, did we ask for that? After a generation of Americans being ignored by their leaders, Americans spoke with a unified voice. And you know what they said? They said, no more bullshit. And they sent Donald J. Trump to the White House. Now, the same people who screwed this country up for 30 years said President Donald Trump would fail. Remember that? And I remember, I was myself, I didn't fully believe in the promises of Donald Trump. He persuaded me because he did such a good job. What happened next? Let's all remember. Gas was $2 a gallon. Yeah. Housing was affordable for young and old alike. Wages were rising. And this word inflation, that's all people talk about now, it wasn't even an issue. We had broad prosperity for every American, rich and poor. Donald Trump stopped the stupid wars and stood up to the bad guys all over the world. He recognized what our failed leadership didn't, that weakness invites American boys and girls to wars that they shouldn't have to fight. American strength promotes peace, and we had a hell of a lot of peace when Donald J. Trump was the President of the United States. I got to get whatever we fed these guys behind me. They're having a good time. Our border, my friends, our border was secure. Overdose deaths were coming down where they had gone up for 15 years. And a lot of people who struggled in my hometown had good jobs and good prosperity, and it happened all across the state of Michigan and Ohio. My mom, she got clean, and she stayed clean. That was my personal, personal victory that happened. And for every lie, remember, for every lie they told about Donald J. Trump, he just kept on plugging away at doing the American people's business. He did it so well, we had take-home pay rising faster than it had in 30 years. Our corrupt leadership, remember this, our corrupt leadership said, if you put tariffs on China, prices will go up. Instead, Donald Trump did exactly that. Manufacturing came back, and prices went down for American citizens. They went up for the Chinese, but they went down for our people. Because when you make your own stuff with the hands of American workers, the whole country prospers. We know that in Michigan better than anywhere. Now, our corrupt leadership said if you enforce the border, people south of the border are going to suffer. But Donald Trump recognized that his first responsibility as president was to the American citizen and not to anybody else. So he shut down that border. He shut off the drug trade. He drove the cartels out of business, and he had overdose deaths falling in this country. What an amazing thing it was. Remember, our corrupt leadership said that you can't defeat ISIS. Remember that? Just a few, few years ago, they said, we're going to have to reinvade Iraq to defeat ISIS. Donald Trump defeated ISIS in a matter of weeks, and then he brought America's sons and daughters home. What an amazing, amazing track record of leadership. But let's be honest, the country wasn't broken in four years, and four years was not enough time to root out all of the corruption. So while Americans were getting richer, a lot of bureaucrats and globalists were getting poor. That was the story of Trump's term. So Kamala Harris, she and her corrupt handlers, they came up with a plan. Now, they couldn't beat Donald Trump in an honest debate, so they decided to engage in censorship. They were going to censor Donald Trump, and they were going to censor his supporters. Now, remember, 
Back in 2020, they lied about Biden's corruption and covered up the fa fact that his family got rich by selling access to the United States government. And Kamala Harris was there for all of it. They lied about the Hunter Biden laptop and encouraged, encouraged big tech to silence the story, and they did. They lied about COVID coming from a Chinese lab and they censored anybody who disagreed. Kamala Harris even went on national TV and said Joe Biden was as sharp as a tack. Even he was clearly mentally incompetent to do the job. And so it's obvious what's been going on, right? Kamala Harris has been calling the shots. And by lying about his mental fitness for the job, she got what she always wanted, which was more power. And what was the result? On her watch, gas prices are up 50%. Housing costs have doubled. You talk to a young person today, young people cannot afford to buy a home in their own country. We're turning a generation of 20 and 30 year olds into permanent debtors. Donald Trump and I believe young people ought to own a stake in their own country, be able to build a life and start a family. That's what, that's what we're fighting for. Grocery prices. Grocery prices under Kamala Harris are up 21%, and I think that undercounts it. A record number of Americans are working multiple jobs. The housing market is as unaffordable as it has ever been. And the average new car costs nearly $50,000. Americans, this is heartbreaking, we now owe more than $1 trillion in credit card debt, a record high at a time when interest rates are going up and up. That's not all she did, my friends. She isn't just causing high prices. She is undoing the incredible work that Donald Trump did to rebuild American manufacturing. Now, we stand very close, of course, to the new Goshen factory, right? That's right. And remember the tie-breaking vote that she cast to send inflation through the roof. Remember that vote? That vote also made Chinese companies like Goshen eligible for millions of your taxpayer dollars. In a presidential election cycle like no other, Michigan is in the center of attention for both Republicans and Democrats as they work feverishly to win those handful of remaining states that are too close to call. On Thursday, Democratic presidential candidate Kamala Harris' husband, Doug Emhoff, made his first campaign stop since the Democratic convention in Chicago, and he did it at a brewery in Kentwood. He talked about why he believes the Harris Waltz team is right for voters. Well, this is my first public event after that amazing convention, so I'm finally, um, I'm, <laughs> the adrenaline is finally back down, but now I'm pumped up again, walking in here and just hearing all the Kamala cheers and all this so great uh, to be out here. And I've got two more states left today alone and then another one tomorrow. Because, um, you, you know, when the few times I get to see my wife, she says, get out there and we got to win this thing. Because <laughs> she's just all about doing the work. It's all focus. It's all discipline. She's not getting too high because she knows we've got 68 days left. And every single minute, every single day counts. And I can kind of keep up with her uh, watching because I know she and Governor Walz were in uh, Georgia yesterday and today doing the work. So um, she says hi, though, by the way. <laughs> so I have been around um, a lot of high profile people in my career. Uh, first as a business person, lawyer, entertainment lawyer, and now in politics. And when some people enter public life, they change. Who is that? No, sorry. <laughs> Wait, is that Kamala <laughs> checking on me? <laughs> um, she might. Uh, and, but some people change, and like, their families don't even recognize them anymore. Not Kamala Harris. The Kamala Harris you see running for president is the most, it's like the most version of her. It's the most authentic version of her. And you can ask anyone in our big, beautiful, blended family who you got to meet during the convention, um, that's who she is. She's the same person that we get to, to love as a family member um, that you are all now seeing. And who is that person? She's joyful, which is a good thing. She's also tough, which is a good thing. And it's her empathy, it's her superpower. Her, 
her ability to understand what other people are going through, that is really her strength. And she's also someone who always steps up when she's needed. And now that the country, even the world, needed somebody, somebody to step into the void, step into the breach, Kamala Harris did that. And she did it in such an incredible way. And she's, I mentioned this in my remarks, she's, she's always been there for our family, always, through thick and thin, and now she's there for our country. And when the stakes are the highest, the expectations are highest, that's when she delivers in the, in the biggest, best version of herself. So, so I'm so proud of her. Um, so I knew of Kamala Harris before that infamous blind date with the phone call and it's Doug and all that. <laughs> Completely true story. And yes, I did have to listen to that voicemail again. Um, but I knew who she was because she was our attorney general and I was a, a business lawyer and she was someone to be reckoned with. Uh, let me tell you something. So I, I knew exactly who she was. Um, she was a force and in a lot of ways uh, feared. Feared for her toughness and feared for her ability to, to ferret out wrongdoing and remediate that. So that is the Kamala Harris I first knew of. I'm like, am I really gonna go on a blind date with her? I, <laughs> I did. I'm glad I did. And um, just like I didn't have to explain to her who I was as a Jewish person. Like, she just knew. She knew who we were, what our traditions, what our values were. I also didn't have to explain to her, like, what I did for a living. I was a business lawyer, and she got it. She understands business. She knew what I did for a living. She knew what the clients were, were doing, and, you know, I didn't have to explain that to her. Um, because she knows um, what's going on with that, and she also knows that business is so important. It's in some ways the lifeblood of, of our communities. It's the lifeblood of what you're all doing. And getting to meet some of the folks backstage and the small business uh, community that they're a part of, this place that we're right here, I mean, this is the heart and soul of our communities. It's the heart and soul of our country. And she knows that. And she... <laughs> And as I think you heard her say too, she approaches everything through the prism of you. In her entire career, she has had one client and one client only, us, the people. And you heard her talk about her experience growing up and her good friend Wanda who was being abused by her stepfather and that led her on a path to become a prosecutor and one of the roles of a prosecutor, yes, is to put very horrible people away that do very horrible things, but it's also to protect the community because that's who she is. She's someone who's out there to, to help and protect us. So that's how she got into that. She believes in safety, safe communities. She also believes in justice. And that has been the hallmark of her career. Um, but she understands that it's not just enough to believe in these things as, as concepts, you know, high, high in the sky concepts, of justice and fairness. She's someone who knows it's gotta be real. And she understands that she's got to use common sense. She's got to be pragmatic to solve these problems and to use the skill she has as a, I'm sorry, there's a clock. <laughs> Uh, use the skill she has as a first-rate trial lawyer and problem solver to solve these problems that face our country and our face our world. That's how she comes at things. Um, she talked about um, some of her accomplishments as a, as a prosecutor. Um, again, this was to put very bad people away who did very horrible things, but it was also to give an opportunity to those who did not commit violent crimes people who needed a way back in into uh, our communities and have a chance to, to succeed and thrive, again, for nonviolent offenders. And she had a program called Back on Track, and it worked. And one of the reasons 
for that was to, for the economy. Because if folks had a chance to get back into the communities, they're gonna have jobs, they're gonna pay taxes, they're gonna help you grow your businesses. And that was one of the reasons for doing that. So that's a part of her pragmatic leadership, even when she was back in her prosecutor days. Uh, I got to know her as a, as a citizen of California when she was our attorney general. And she told the story about how she took on the big banks during the mortgage crisis. And um, she, she didn't do it only to get from four billion to 20 billion, although that was pretty amazing. And she held her ground. But for her, she was really thinking about the families involved. She was thinking about her own mother who saved for years and years and years to finally be able to buy a home. And she's thinking about just folks like that who have that home and have that lawn that they love and the garden and they take such pride of ownership that this is something that they work so hard for, big part of the community. And so that is also what drove her in that work, to make sure that there was dignity and that there was fairness and it wasn't just about getting that money, which again, helped mitigate a very horrible situation, but it was also to get people back in those homes that they love and make sure that they could still experience that joy of home ownership and that lawn and that sense of community and belonging that we all have, because again, it's that empathy. She understands what's actually going on with people and she turns that into action and policy. So that's Kamala Harris. So this election could not be more clear. I've heard the other speakers, you've heard that. Um, but it's really about who sees and understands voters. Who gets it? And it's going to be won by the candidate who will actually make all of our lives better, not just the lives of a select few, right? And it's also going to make, it's going to represent what most of us want. Most of us in this country want what Kamala Harris and Tim Walls are talking about. Very few people want what Donald Trump and J.D. Vance are actually talking about. And again, look at Project 2025, listen to the words that they're saying. This is not anything that most people want. And don't be distracted by all the, the nonsense and the name calling and all the, the ridiculous BS, as I call it. Listen to what they're actually saying. Again, keep in mind that campaign rallies are designed to motivate people to vote, and the two sides in today's show have very different ideas about how to do that. We'll be right back to the poll. As of right now, polling suggests there are about 93 electoral votes up for grabs, and in the seven states where those votes are is where campaigns will be spending the bulk of their time and money. With Michigan as one of those states, we will keep following the candidates and their surrogates as they come in on a weekly, if not daily basis, and bring it to you, to the point.